so covering chapter four it would be on minerals. Now the question is, what are the five characteristics of minerals? Which is easy, and Sam here will tell you. Yes. And the other question will be, what are the seven tests used to ID and that them? Is me. And I that's me. And that's will tell you that. The five characteristics of identifying minerals, which would be solid. They have to. They have a crystalline structure. They have a chemical composition. They're naturally occurring, and or they're inorganic. Now, each one is basically self-explanatory. One's solid. It's really compact, like a hard coal. Yeah, like the cells are hugging each other. The atoms are really tight together, man. Yeah. The crystalline structure would be, it kind of looks like a crystal. It is all purtiful, which is the picture with the title that's before this video. Yeah. It being, having a chemical composition, which means it reacts with certain chemicals inside the in the world anywhere between you know calcite um being exposed to carbonic acid it giving off smoke and naturally occurring is it occurs from the earth it's all homely natural like green everything is from the earth and organic would be you know it's man-made kind of like um I would say the like fake diamonds. The fake diamonds. There you go. The cubic zirconium. Ooh. That's that was the name. And now yeah. he will explain the seven tests used to ID them. That I show. Now the first thing that you have for mineral identification, because I keep my stuff, is the mineral identification lab, which I appreciate you for making it up for us. Great. First is the color. You know, what other kind of color it is. It's a black, tan, purple, yellow, green, green, purple, you know, orange. Also, you have the luster, which can be dull or shiny, you know, however the light reflects off of it. Like lead, you know, it's kind of iffy, iffy on it. You know, thank you for the light that you didn't provide. <laughs> but, let there also, be light. And there it was. But also, you know, it can be something like obsidian, which is kind of... Not two, but you know, it's very kind of dark, dark, and there's nothing that could really. Also, you have the texture, something that's really rough that'll cut you. Maybe something that's soapy or real silky kind of. Or something like Sam, that's really it's kind of rough. Me, kind of silky smooth skin. Oh. <laughs> you can also tell by the streak, which is kind of like the color. You know, you'll have something that might be, might be kind of gray, but when you slide it on something like you're writing with it. It might pop up orange, which makes you think, eh, color's not really reliable. Which it is not, because it's the most unreliable one. Also, you have the hardness. Now, me, I'm a nice guy, but my diamonds here, they I mean, they're like a, on a 10. The hardest ones out there. Ones out there. That, that's pretty intense, dude. They bro. can cut through metal. Ooh, that it can. That it can. Ooh, metal is not as hard as diamond. Which makes you think, diamond is the most hard one out there. Also, you have the cleavage fracture, which, no, don't get no wrong ideas, but, you know, um, it's kind of the way it breaks. You know, if I throw a diamond on the floor, just smash it, you know, it's going to have jagged fractures everywhere. Is it going to kind of, like, peel off, you know? So we have, have that. And also, you have special properties, which, let's see here, we're going to read these notes, and we're going to come to Galena. Galena is... I can't read my handwriting, so we're going to go to calcite. Calcite releases CO2 when HCl is added. Which is carbonic acid. Oh. As I said before, explain the five characteristics. All right, let's see here. That I can't read. Um, is that biotite? Biotite. Plates are flexible. Flexible. That's good. Flexible. And pyrite, which looks like gold. Fool's gold. People that go out find gold what they think is gold. And I'm not used to the camera. Yeah. But it's gold. And that is it of the mineral identification level. That will be covering chapter four. Yeah. This is chapter five. This is chapter five. Yes. Which we will be covering igneous rocks. We will also be going into chapter six covering sedimentary and metamorphic rocks because they're it's just like all working together in a one. But one of the questions would be, how is an igneous rock formed? Igneous rocks are called fire rocks. They are formed either underground or above ground. 
Underground, they are formed when melted rock called magma, deep within the Earth's Deep within the Earth becomes trapped in the small pockets. As these pockets of magma cool slowly underground, the magma becomes igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are also formed when volcanoes erupt, causing the magma to rise above the Earth's surface. When magma appears above the Earth, it is called lava. Igneous rocks are formed when lava cools above ground. So tell me this straight, Sam. So magma and lava are the same exact thing. It's just whether or not that's under or underground. Over or under. Yes, that is true. Well, that is something very scientific, if I do say so myself. How is shadow and pedantic? Shadow and pedantic. Rambling. All right. The next one we would be discussing, which would be a sedimentary rock. I which think you mean metal. Oh, it's sedimentary. sedimentary. Yeah, you skipped it. Thanks. Sedimentary. Read it. All right. Well, for thousands of years, even millions of years, little pieces of our little earth have eroded. Breaking down and worn away by wind and water, you know, these little bits of our earth are washed downstream while they settle at the bottoms of the river, lakes, and oceans. Layer after layer of eroded earth is deposited on top of each other. Those layers are pressed down more and more through the time until the bottom of the layers slowly turn to rock. And this would be sedimentary. That now is. we are going to go into metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that are morphed into another kind of rock. These rocks were once igneous or sedimentary rocks. How do sedimentary rocks and igneous rocks change? Well, the rocks under tons and tons of pressure, which fosters heat build up. And this causes them to change. If you examine metamorphic rock samples closely, you will discover how flattened some of the grains on the rocks are. And that would explain metamorphic rocks. This is ch now covering chapter five and six, which would be the three different types of rocks. We will now discuss briefly how each different type of rock is formed, starting with granite. Granites. Now, granite rocks are igneous rocks, which were formed by slowly cooling pockets of magma. Chica chica magma. Chica chica that were trapped beneath the earth. Surface granite is used for long-lasting monuments and for trim and decoration buildings. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful song. What do you want? Who did applaud him? Pause for a moment. Okay, so now another rock would be basalt. Magma is formed by decom the, the, the decompressive melting of the Earth's mantle, which then releases in volcanoes and forms of lava. With that cooling on the Earth's surface, it creates basalt. Also, we would be talking about limestone. Limestone rocks are sedimentary rocks that are made from mineral calcite, which is came from the beds of evaporated seas and lakes, and from sea animal shells. This rock is used in concrete and is excellent building stone for humid regions. Not sure if you know this, but you forgot the er, 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 for oh, magma. Sure. <laughs> now I'm going to go on and tell you about shale. Shale is a type of rock, a sediment rock formed by clay that is compacted together for pressure. They are used to make bricks and other materials that is fired in a kiln, which is also known as a stone. Yeah, because for you know, any like, yeah, video gamers, mm -hmm. RuneScape, smelting, remember World of Warcraft, smelting, remember. Slate, since you did too, I'm gonna go ahead and go for my second one. Now, <clears throat> here we go. Slate is a metamorphic rock. Slate is actually shale that had low heat, not very much pressure put on it. Slate and mostly formed in the mountain areas. It takes thousands of years for slate to change. Bravo, bravo. Thank you, thank you. Now, Discussing marble, which is our final one. Marble is a metamorphic limestone. It's when limestone is heated and has pressure put onto it, its calcite is melted. Larger crystals are formed, and those crystals become marble. And that closes chapter 5 and chapter 6. I will see you in class. I hear you, man. We are covering chapter 7. What you had just seen before us, what you have witnessed, 
is a form of chemical weathering and a form of physical weathering. I will need you to decide which is which, but I'll tell you one thing, that first photo was physical weathering. You have witnessed it. That you have witnessed it. Frost wedging, that is physical weathering. Sam, would you like to branch off of that for us? Sure. The second picture that you saw is an example of chemical weathering, which no. is yes. <gasps> okay, it is the example of oxidation. Ooh. Now oxidation, which would be, you know, like the rusting of a car. And that's you know? illegal in seven states. <laughs> Go ahead. I really wonder. So Coming off, you have your physical and your chemical weather, and your physical changes the outside appearance of it. It still remains the same item, but it changes the outside appearance. Uh -huh. Now, your chemical weathering changes the actual composition of the mineral or the thing that it's changing. Like, I don't know, like the outside of a car. It's one type of thing, and then it rusts, and now it's a different type of thing because it's called rust. Right? That is true. Very, very, very true. correct. Now, Looking at this nice rubric that I've been looking at the entire couple of videos as soon as I can get it synced with you know, the camera, I will discuss, you know, frost wedging. Now, Aaron discussed frost wedging earlier. That I can do. Now, frost wedging is a very intricate process. Now, you have a rock that has a little crease in it, you know, a little teeny kind of crack. You have some precipitation, if you say well, like you got some rain, floods down in there, fills to crack. Then, it's really, really cold, and it freezes. Water expands as it freezes, so you have this much water in the crack that expands. Evaporates away, more precipitation, rain falls in it, cracks more. Comes back down, breaks it down, you know, so on, so on. But frost wedging can only occur in places that it will freeze and it will unfreeze. You read my mind, sir. I was going to ask you that question. My right. freak. Okay. Now, discussing tree roots. Tree roots is a thing of physical weathering, which it could be something you see in your everyday life. You could be walking down the road and you see plant roots coming out of the sidewalk and it's cracking the concrete in the sidewalk. That's considered tree root. It's a form of physical. It's slowly breaking it down because the tree roots need to go somewhere to get water. In order to get water, they have to spread. And if the concrete's in its way, it's just like, you know what, forget you. I'm going to, you know, break through and try to get my water fix. Like a... Like a... And those are some of the things that we will be explaining. Now, it is time for exfoliation. Can't read that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be going over exfoliation, dissolution, and oxidation. This is a continuance of what you just saw earlier. Now, as we are covering, exfoliation is like a removal of layers. Take it like, you know, you're going to a beauty salon. And you get your face all exfoliated, skin all exfoliated. It's the same term. It's a removal of layers. See, you know, when you sleep, you lose dead skin cells. You are slowly exfoliating every night. I know that sounds really creepy and probably really nasty, but you go through it every day, so you might as well know now. But see, I don't think this will slowly go to beauty salons. So I think that's natural. Yes. See, I'm a good psycho. <laughs> but now we're going to go over to dissolution, which is kind of dissolving. Now, as we said before, calcite, it releases CO2 because it dissolves in the word... What word? The <laughs> HCl. Oh, in carbonic acid. So you need to that tell me one. these things sometimes. But, you know, that's a part of dissolution because it dissolves in there. Also, you know, you take water, which is really, you know, ah, quenching. But if you throw something in here, like... A ball of sand, if you will, kind of. It's all gonna break up, you know. Kool Aid. Kool Aid. Kool Aid. Kool Aid. <laughs> Throw Kool Aid in there, stir it up. It changes the whole thing. But now, if you leave Kool Aid in the refrigerator for you know a week or so, you kind of notice it's still the same thing. That's because Kool Aid, unlike tea, the tea will actually, you know, it doesn't dissolve completely. The tea particles will float down. And the water, which is live, will stay on top because it's not as dense. The Kool-Aid just kind of, you know, blends in. 
Okay, and the final thing that we'll be discussing for chapter 7, which would be oxidation. Oxidation Ooh. is the same thing you see almost every day in life, which is the second picture in that title that you saw. Now tell which me is, more of this oxidation. I was in the middle of that, sir. All right. Now oxidation is, as I said, the same thing you see every day which would be considered like rust. You see rust on cars, you see rust on rocks, which is in that picture that you just saw for the title with the catchy little song right there, you know, for us nerds. But <laughs> rust can happen anywhere that there's a high amount of salt in the air. Like here in Florida, out in Destin, which is somewhere that way. You're okay. wrong, it's actually that way, brother. Actually, it's that way. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so on Destin, in Destin, there's a lot of beaches. A lot of beaches means there's a lot of salt in the air. With your car not being waxed, it can get rust. Rust will slowly break it down the metal and cause it to break. And this is where my intelligence comes in. Up north, you know, when it freezes, you know, it gets really cold, and the road kind of freezes over, they have to salt the road. So, you know, your car doesn't catch sliding. <laughs> Yes, it'll explode probably too. You have to get out really fast. But when you're driving by, the car's tired. You're going for my water, man. <laughs> Put that up here. Okay, but when you're driving in your car, your tires are going. It's picking up the salt and it's throwing it up in t under your car. So if you're buying a car from up north or something, you know, you have to check the bottom of it because it might have oxidated because of the salt there. Yes. And this, my friends, is chapter 7. The pictures that you saw in the title with the most amazing Judas Priest song ever were first the picture of the water cycle, then the four pictures after it were the different. The first one was rain. The different types of surface water, surface fresh water to be exact. Precipitation. Now the first one was precipitation and rain water. Okay, and the second one was well water. The third one was. Apparently he doesn't know. Rivers. And the very last one, which is our friend... The Long Long Cat. The Long 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 Cat. Who's cold. Who's very, very, cold. very cold. Now, describing what we have here, the water cycle. Now, if you need to stop and go back to the picture, you can because, you know, this is a video and we're awesome like that. The water cycle starts as any which way. It just moves in a circle. But to be simplistic about it, we're going to start first in a ocean. Now, oceans, they can get hot. You got the sun beating down. And it gets hot and it evaporates. That gets in, gets in, gets in, gets in. It is condensation up in the clouds. Now, as the clouds are going and it gets too, it's just too heavy. You know, it's like from, you know, a Miss Wasuli in there to a Salmon and Aaron in there. And it just drops into precipitation. Oh my god. But now this precipitation is going to hit the ground. It's going to go over, you know, do whatever it what needs to do. What is that called when it goes it is go It's called precipitation. No, when it rolls. When it rolls down, it is called runoff. But runoff, sometimes it can sink. Which is called... Into, which is permeability. Which can also be called percolation. Percolation, too. Which is not in this chapter, but we'll see, we're smart, so... Oh, I don't know if it's in the chef or not. But it's not in this paper here, so. So, anyway, it's going to run off, you know, go into canals, streams, rivers, <laughs> ponds, lake, puddles. You know, do whatever it wants to do. You know, give it a little space and freedom to then be itself. And that's, you know, kind of how we got lakes and rivers started and all that junk. Yes. Now, at the end of this video, we will include the picture of the headwaters of a stream. Now, the headwaters are very tricky things, and go ahead and explain oh, those. Yes, they're so tricky. The headwaters of a stream describe how they're formed. They're formed at the mouths of rivers and streams. Now, the mouth, 
tell me straight, that is the beginning. It is the either the beginning or the end. It's anywhere where it goes into a bigger body of water. Mm -hmm. The head is the beginning. Yes. Now, it can be formed, as I said, at the beginning or the end, as long as it goes into a bigger body of water, whether it's retracting from or falling into. I like that word, retracting. Retracting. Exactly. And now we'll be covering Chapter 9. Before we end this, though, sophistication. All right, we're going to be covering chapter 10, which is on caves, caverns, sinkholes, and freshwater gr in the ground. We just had lunch. We had some, you know, cheddar cheese ruffles, all right? Some, you know, cream soda, but it's empty now. I think I just stuck it. Yeah, I just stuck it in water. Amazing, right? And we're going to have Aaron explain sinkholes to you. Now I'm going to put my glasses so that I can read exactly what we have behind this webcam for and now that I'm ready to read, sinkholes are most commonly thought of as physical depressions or holes in the surface of the land. Not only sinkholes, however, are as visible as dramatic as a home or a roadway falling into the ground. Many times, sinkholes' activity never manifests itself on the surface of the land, now making it harder to detect. Now, what they're trying to say is sinkholes can be made anywhere. Carbonic acid plays a huge role in that, too. You know, you're driving down the road, <laughs> sinkhole, you're dead, that's it. Well, you might not be dead. Sinkhole, that's it, you're dead. Okay, sure. Now, discussing what? A cavern, and I hey, just don't like that, a cavern and a cave. There's a main difference between a cavern and a cave. They're both generally located underground, but a cavern has, has no, no opening. And a cave has, has a very visible opening. Exactly. Now, they're both usually underground, developed by water through the ground that normally goes through and percolates through the ground that erodes away <laughs> the ground. And, and it grows, that goes through the inside. Now, there are many different types of fresh water that go through the groundwater. Could be anywhere between springs, wells, geysers, Gosh, lakes, rivers. And wetlands, kind of Old Faithful is a very good example of a geyser. A spring would be located to where runoff could follow into an area or water rising to form an area that has fresh water. A well could either be um, naturally made or man-made depending on the aquifer that's aquifers, there. Aquifers, aquaclues, aquaclues, are they the ones that aquifers shoot up in the air? Block. Okay, so aquifers. Geysers are the oh. ones. Geysers are the ones. Yes, which I explained geysers. Lakes are the same thing as springs except for they're just like really, 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 really big. Rivers start from runoff coming from higher mountains or cliffs or anything from higher elevation that go down and make erode pathways into the ground to create rivers. And wetlands are the areas that are beside rivers and springs for when they flood, they go a certain area and the water is trapped on the surface. Wow, yeah. sounds like some very intense stuff, man. It very is. So, summarize this in a recap for us real quick. All right, for chapter 10. Caves no vi have a visible entrance underground. Caverns, they do, do not. not. Sinkholes are very dangerous. They're formed by carbonic acid, not eroding acid the ground. Carbonic acid under, under it. Yes. Now it's very strange because cars, cars can actually fall into sinkholes. You know, it, it's not just something that you know, you know, it's gonna happen right now or right now, but. 
I mean, they've had instances where a car's been toppled over or, you know, a house has been sunk into a sinkhole. I mean, stuff like that happens. Life is just not all about pancakes and biscuits. Yep. It's <laughs> and then you have springs, wells, geysers, lakes, rivers, and wetlands. Those are different ways that groundwater and our water from many types of instances get up to the surface, which we explained earlier. Right. And, now, and that concludes chapter 10. But he's you, not going to hit the end part yet. Because after this, we have some amazing bloopers for you. And we have a really nice song to go on after this, too. So, stay tuned. Watch. Be amazed. I hope Ryan is going safely. And we miss you. I'm <laughs> sorry.